If you're taking uh, notes, writing down uh, scriptures, go to Ephesians chapter 4. We are in a, our, our series on Ephesians we call Master Class. And the reason why we call it Master Class is uh, we look at Paul as being kind of the master. He, is, uh, writing, he has written this letter that was circulated to a ton of churches and it has been attributed to the church in Ephesus, um, but really it was utilized to circulate and to encourage, to teach, and to challenge believers in multiple churches, taking each church to a master class of this is what the kingdom of God is like, uh, which is why we have chapters 1 through 3. Here's the kingdom. Chapters 4 through 6, here's how to live it. Here's the kingdom and everything that it is, and then all of a sudden we transition to our chapter today, which is, here's how to live it. And so over the next few weeks, this is where we get what I, I hope would be very practical advice from, from this pastor, this missionary, teaching us how to practically live out the kingdom. You do not want to miss next week. The best preacher uh, at this church, and we say at this church, he comes here once a year. Uh, but it's the best preacher that, that we have. Uh, J.P. Dorsey will be here, and he will bring the funk next week. He is amazing. Uh, our people love him. I've had people get themselves discharged out of the hospital to come hear him, um, which they have never done for me. So that just is what it is. Uh, but that's, I'm very, very, very pumped about J.P. being with us. Um, I love movies. There's two types of people in the world. There are TV show people, and there are movie people. And you're saying, well, we have to be, we can be both. I guess so, but no one serves two masters. And I'm misusing scripture right there. Um, I, I'm a movie person. My wife is a TV person amongst, amongst of the many differences that we have. Uh, but I love movies. And some of my favorite movies have actors that go into a mode of acting or a style of acting that is a little bit different. And it's called full method or method acting. If you don't know what method acting is, the most simple definition is this. It is an acting technique that is fully inhabiting the role of the character. So you're doing more than just studying a character, like if you are going to play a historical figure, you would do more than just read about it and study the historical figure. You would basically transform your body, your life, to become, to literally become that character. And so I've got a number of examples of people who went what's called full method. Marlon Brando, one of the original method actors to prepare for um, a movie called The Men, Brando stayed in a hospital bed for an entire month to get into the mindset of what an injured veteran would feel like because that's what he was playing. Tom Hanks gained and then lost 50 pounds for castaway. He refused to cut his hair or bathe, leading to a nasty staph infection. There's some dedication. My wife would have moved me out. Robert De Niro, known for doing whatever is necessary to convey his character, uh, and he's faithful to the method. For the movie Taxi Driver, uh, De Niro worked 12-hour taxi shifts and would pick up passengers in New York City during his breaks on set. And this type, kind of dedication helped create the type of character and the type of actor that he is. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, who is an avowed vegetarian, for the movie The Revenant ate raw bison, slept in an animal carcass, and withstood freezing temperatures to portray this frigid frontiersman named Hugh Glass. Uh, to portray the blind musician Ray Charles, the actor Jamie Foxx glued his eyes shut for up to 14 hours a day during filming. The most mind-blowing method actor to me is Daniel Day-Lewis. He is known for his extreme devotion to roles. For the 2006 film, The Ballad of Jack, uh, Jack and Rose, he lived a separate life from his wife, who was not only his co-star, but his director, in order to experience the character's sense of isolation. For the movie My Left Foot, in which he portrayed a young man with cerebral, uh, cerebral palsy, he insisted that the crew carry him around the set and spoon-feed him his meals. In the, credible, in the Crucible, he decided to live on set, and the set was a replica of the colonial village with no running water or electricity and using only tools that settlers had in the 17th century. Day-Lewis uh, Day built his own house on set. And as he was known for playing the movie, uh, playing um, Abraham Lincoln in the movie Lincoln, uh, it said that he lived that 
alter ego of Abraham Lincoln for about nine months. In fact, Sally Fields, who was his co-star, said that he decided to start texting her, but only text her in the character of Abraham Lincoln. These actors are going full method is all about taking whatever persona and they inhibit and have, uh, inhibit that role in such a way that it becomes every part of life. It's not like, like when I come here, I'm Pastor Dave. Can I tell you when I go home, I am not Pastor Dave? Just not. I don't tell my kids or my wife, thus saith the Lord. I don't think I say that all that often at home. Um, but I, I have home Dave. I've got climbing wall Dave. I've got, uh, I'm still the same person, but sometimes you play different roles in life. Um, but with these actors, whoever they're playing, they sink themselves so far into it that it's hard to distinguish like Daniel Day-Lewis from the person playing Lincoln or the person playing whatever, or De Niro playing, being Robert De Niro, or De Niro being the taxi driver. And what does this have to do with anything with Ephesians chapter four? I'm glad you've asked me that question. Because this is really what Paul is trying to get into. Paul wants the church in Ephesus and the churches around that are reading this letter, he wants them to do that. He wants them to go full method. And it's more than just, let me put on something when I go to church. Let me put on a role when I show up to K-First. Let me put on a role when I show up to worship with my friends. He wanted people to do more than just kind of put on a hat or put on the church clothes. He wanted them to inhabit, to go full method and say, you've heard about the kingdom of God for three chapters. Let me now bring you or invite you into a place where you're going full method. You are inhabiting the role of what God has called you to be. And to begin to inhabit this life of being in Christ, of giving him all access and following him with every bit of our life because Jesus doesn't want to be the Lord over your Sunday life. He wants to be the Lord over all of your life. He wants to do more than inhabit an hour of, of your Sunday morning. He wants to inhabit your life. He's not there to be an accessory. He is the main character. He is the plot. He is the story. He's the beginning and the end. And he wants to see your life transformed. And I don't know if we have any list makers in the house. Anybody are list makers? I got a few of you. My wife should raise both of her hands. Uh, list makers. If you are a list maker, then Ephesians 4 is the bee's knees for you. And I don't know what the bee's knees means, but that's what it is for you. It is full of lists because Paul, who is writing to these churches, is wanting to kind of challenge them and help them to go full method. You, this is who Christ is. It's time to inhabit the role. No plan games. Exactly. Thank you for that amen up there. It's time to be that which Jesus has shown you. So I simply made three simple points today, three simple points that I want you to get today as we preach this message called Full Method. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, Paul wrote the church to say, don't neglect the process, your process and progress. Excuse me. Don't neglect, neglect your progress. I think so often we can neglect progress because we in this culture have put so much into an end game or a final product. And it's no wonder that so many of us can get frustrated with ourselves or with our spouse or with the people around us or with, um, for me, with the sports teams in my life, that we want a finished product, but we fail to understand that before we get to the product, there have to, has to be a process. And within that process, the best way to navigate the process is to understand the progress that God has made. Paul wants to tell his church, don't ignore the progress. Don't fail to look at what you are growing in and what you are growing through. Ephesians chapter one, I'm just gonna start, excuse me, chapter four, verse one says, therefore, a prisoner, I therefore, a prisoner from the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with on one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, for there is one body, one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended down high, to lead a host of captives, he gave gifts to men. And that's out of Psalms chapter 68, verse 18. Paul begins talking about, listen, I'm urging you to live a manner. 
or in the Greek language, he would be saying, I'm urging you to continue to live in the manner. In other words, something took place in your life, something happened, something impacted, I'm encouraging you to continue in that. And there are times that we fail to continue primarily because we have yet to see the progress. We, see, we don't see where we wanna be, we don't see where we, we think we should have arrived, and we tend to scrap and to, and to just throw things aside because we haven't reached that point. But I wonder if we would see more encouragement, I wonder if the church would see more hope, I wonder if we would see more peace and more strength, I wonder if we would see just, just more of, of maybe a lighter atmosphere within churches if we stopped looking at what we haven't become and we started celebrating what God has already done. Don't neglect the progress. And Paul writes these things. He's like, I want you to, to not just do these things, but continue in these things. I want you to understand something, that when we gather here at church, and I'm talking to those that are joining with us or a n- number of people that are joining with us online or maybe for those deer hunters in opening day that you're watching from your blind. My dad does that while he's hunting. Yes, he watches YouTube and sermons while he hunts. Earbuds, that's how you do it. But what I wanted to say to every single person joining with us is this. It's church is not a place of perfection. It's not a gathering of perfection. It's not a place where everyone is joined together that all has it all together. Because I've seen you guys. I watch you all on social media. You do not have it all together. But the church isn't a gathering of perfection. It is a place of progress. You've shown up here because you want to make progress. You want to grow. You haven't reached the pinnacle. And if that's you, then you're in a good place. You're in a good place with me. I'm in a good place with you. Because what doesn't feel safe is if I'm showing up to people that have to act like they've got it all perfect. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to act it. You don't have to live in perfection. You don't have to try for it. You just have to keep following Jesus because if we will go after Jesus, Jesus will give us the progress. And if we'll go after the progress, we can stop serving perfection. We can stop serving perfection. Some of us have made an idol out of perfection. And some of our marriages are paying the price of perfection. Some friendships are paying the price of perfection. Churches pay the price of perfection. And I'm here to say, I wonder if we can see a turnaround in our life, a turnaround in our joy, a turnaround in the peace within our own spirit if we stopped serving perfection and we started going after progress. What would our children look like if we stopped telling them what they haven't reached and begin to tell them what they have reached? Imagine the, the explosion in health in the marriages of our area if husbands and wives stopped telling the, each other, this is what you haven't been, but we start speaking to them and saying, listen, this is how much you've grown. This is how much I see. This is how much healing has taken place. This is how much you've done. This is how much I've grown. What if we focus on it? And that's what Paul is getting at. And he didn't look at the church and say, this is what you haven't done yet. He says, this is what you have. And he identifies, here's your first list. You list makers. He identifies five areas. He says, man, keep growing. Don't just reach gentleness. Keep growing in gentleness. Some of your translations might say weakness. Or, sorry, meekness. Meekness or gentleness simply defined as strength under control. Which, and then you have gentleness. You have self-control. You have patience. I don't know, I'm not going to take a poll on who needs patience in the house. That's all of us right now. You know what patience is? Patience is not the ability to wait. Patience, biblical patience is this. It's how you act while you're waiting. What's Paul saying? You've made progress, but keep growing in it. Number four, unselfish love. Keep, you've you've experienced it, now keep growing in it. Number five, unity, which is where we get verses 11 through 13, in fact, a majority of the middle of this chapter is all about facilitating, facilitating unity. You want to know where unity starts? Start right, circling the word one in verses four through seven. And then start circling the word all. And then go into the middle of the chapter and see how that God has given gifts to the church, apostles, missionaries, uh, missionaries evangelists, pastors, teachers. You begin to see how God has given gifts to bring unity. And that really primarily is what this chapter is famous for, is that five-fold ministry. But there is so much more. Paul wants to just hit us hard and say, stop focusing on the lack of progress and go after progress. I love what Paul's words to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, that in Christ, 
that you are new creatures. We are new creatures. And we go after the Lord. And I totally gave my admin the wrong scripture to have up on the screen. But surprise, you should learn that one too. We'll preach about that one another day. Second Corinthians, we have seen that we are new creatures. The old has passed and the new has gone. And I've had people say, well, I have a hard time finding the progress in my life because I still battle with sin. Anybody else battle with sin in the house? Anybody? Do people not raising their hands? Put two up now. We all battle with sin. All of us. Why? Because even though we are new creations and we have been made new in Christ, even though we are new on the inside, that we have the spirit of Christ inside of us, we still deal with the physical outside. And just to encourage you, because I don't know about you, I get encouraged when other people struggle. Anybody else in the house, you get encouraged when other people struggle? Thank you. Gary, you and I are the only honest people in the room today. I'll just talk to you over here. Paul talks about in Romans chapter uh, 7, verses 5 through 17, he says, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. I mean, story of my life. The things I know, the progress I need to build on, I seem like I keep wanting to do the opposite, and yet the opposite things that I don't want to do, I keep on doing. And I'm here to encourage you that if Paul, perhaps the greatest apostle, perhaps the greatest missionary, the greatest pastor that has ever lived outside of Jesus, if Paul struggled with dealing with what we call the flesh, or what even the scripture might call the old man, I like using the old persona. If Paul struggled with that, then it means that you and I still have those struggles. And if that was a daily struggle for Paul, it's going to be a daily struggle for you, which leads me to number two. So number one, don't neglect your progress. Number two, don't go backwards. Don't go backwards. Verse 17. Now I say this to testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened their understanding, alienated, and the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous. They have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice of every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Paul says it's time to move forward. And when you're doing that, make sure you're not slipping backwards. Sometimes we can make a little bit of progress and we can relax in it and not realize that we may have slipped back into something else. Paul says, don't forget your progress, and at the same time, don't go backwards. Have you ever broken up with somebody before? Thank you, Gary. You and I are just gonna have a dialogue today. I had to break up with somebody a couple weeks ago. Maybe it's a better way to say it. I had to cancel an internet provider. And I don't know if you've ever canceled an internet provider and recorded it. It's like you're breaking up with a significant other. I'm on the phone, I'm like, listen, it's not me, it's you. <laughs> and then on the other line, what can I do to keep you? I, I, no, 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 I, my heart has moved on. I've already made another commitment. But are you sure we can make some changes? I, no, I don't think you can make those changes. We're just not right together any longer. And we have this whole conversation, and I wake, I close, I, like, like I close the deal, hang up the phone. I think to myself, I feel like I just broke up with somebody. I feel like somebody was so torn up on the other line. And granted, I'm just another number. But you get off the phone, and it's always the most painful conversation, isn't it? It's that conversation that just says, I just want to make a five-minute call that says, hey, I'm just canceling you guys. Just cut me off. I'm good. And hang up. And they're like, no, let's transfer you to a, a cancellation specialist. I'm like, I don't want to talk to a cancellation specialist and you go through this whole breaking of process and you lose like a half hour of your life and you hang up and you feel like you just need a nap Paul is saying listen don't neglect your progress and at the same time don't go backwards how do we not go backwards it's some of us need to break up with ourselves some of us need to break up with the way that we used to live before we came to Christ 
because there is this tendency or this proclivity that we put our faith in Jesus and we put, we've got the Spirit of God living inside of us. There's this proclivity, this desire of what we know as the old persona, the old man, this old person, the former person, let's say. There is this proclivity to want to go back and to continue living because that's all we knew and that's the way that we just talk. That's just the way that I do business. That's just the way that I tell stories. That's just the way that I talk to my wife. That's just the way. That's just that way. That's just the way. But I wonder, I wonder if we need to get to the place where we have to look at the way that we were before Christ and admit that was never Christ-like. And if it wasn't Christ-like, then we need to stop imitating the way that we used to live and start breaking up with that person in order to embrace the new life God has in store for us. Because it's not enough to have the good head knowledge. It's not enough to have good doctrine. Do I want you to have good doctrine? Yes, I want you to have good doctrine. I want you to have great doctrine. I want you to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I want you to believe in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I want you to believe in one true God. I want you to believe in the Trinity. I want you to believe that Dallas Cowboys are demonic. There's just good doctrine that I want you to have. <laughs> but, with, but what Paul is trying to get at is this. That good doctrine is enough. Having good belief is not enough. So therefore, don't go backwards, move forward. I wrote this down earlier this week. Solid doctrine without the fruit of Christ's character impedes the kingdom of God. You can't have good beliefs without a good life connected to it. And I didn't say a perfect life, but a life that is striving to follow after Jesus. A life that decides, I have to do more than know it up here. I need to let that produce the fruit of my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The fruit of the Spirit taught in Galatians. That was last year's series. This is the stuff that's got to be born from my life. Strong doctrine is not enough. I read, uh, I read a book on Ephesians by Joyce Meyer. I love Joyce Meyer. And this is what she said. The reputation of the church has been severely damaged by people who know the right things but fail to do them. Their doctrine may be right, but their behavior is not. They're often very proud of what they think they know and are quick to tell others what they should do while not doing it themselves. We need both strong, accurate doctrine and behavior that backs up what we say we believe. So good. We need something that backs up what we say we believe. Verse 22, I love this. For verse 22. It says, put off, circle those words in your scripture journals, so to put off your, your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt with deceitful desires. Circle the words put off. That word put off is actually, actually used seven times in scripture, and it is normally connected to taking off soiled or dirty clothes. And not only has, does it have a reference to taking off something that is filthy, it is actually something that is only done by yourself. It's something that's willfully done. You've made the choice. What am I trying to say? Jesus is not gonna come in and willfully take off your bad habits. He will give you the strength. He will give you the, he will give you the power. He will give you the peace. He will give you the encouragement. But ladies and gentlemen, you and I have to willfully put off the things that don't connect to the life of Jesus. Jesus doesn't put his hand in the back of our head and, and begin to shape our words anymore. We, he puts the words in our spirit, but we have to speak them out. He puts the, the will in our life, but we've got to live it out. That we can't blame God for our bad habits. We've got to willfully put them off. We, he can't decide for us. As a youth pastor, one of my favorite things of doing years of youth ministry was doing a winter retreat. And what we would do is we would take our students up to Cedarville, Michigan. It's in the UP. It is cold as cold gets. It is Siberia and is beautiful and wonderful. We would go up there for four and a half days and just get a hold of God, let God get a hold of us. And it was just, it was beautiful. It was powerful. But whenever I came back, I always knew that I had coming at me a phone call, two or three or ten from middle school parents. Does my microphone sound weird right now? I got people like this, I got people like this. Testing, am I good? Baby, can you hand me that mic?
testing. Here we go. Much better. We would go up there for four and a half days, and we would just spend a lot of time with the Lord. And we do tons of activities. So, so kids, they're, they're wet from the snow, wet from sweating. And I would get this phone call a couple days after from a bunch of parents that are always middle school, middle school parents. They are always specifically parents of sixth and seventh graders, and they would always say the same thing to me. Why is it that when I took my kid's suitcase and went to put their clothes away and wash their clothes, why was there a stack of clean underwear in there that they never wore? And I'm like, well, because they didn't change their underwear. They said, that's our point, Pastor Dave. Why didn't you check and make sure? Because I'm the number one, I get arrested for things like that. (laughs) Number two, I can't decide that for them. But they sat in the same pair of skivvies for like four days. I'm like, yeah, they paid the price. Well, their roommates paid the price. Like, what does this have to do with anything? The, the, the lesson I would have to tell parents, and I began to write letters to middle school parents, you, you, your kids are in charge of changing their own underwear. Like, my counselors, my leaders are not going to check anything. They have to do it. Why? It needed to be a willful decision that I'm not going to live in some filthy thing, that I'm actually going to willfully make a decision to change my underwear. But Paul is trying to say, listen, don't go back to what you were living or don't go back to what you were saved out of. He says, but listen, nobody's going to do it for you. You have to willfully lay it down. That's why he says in verse 24, put it on. It's a willful decision. It's putting it on. He says the same thing in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, when he says this, but put on the Lord Jesus. What is he saying? He's saying, go full method with this thing. Take that persona that you used to have, put it off. Grab the new potential. I like the word potential. Why? Because it's unrealized. It's unrealized until you engage in it. Put on that new persona, that new potential. Put that on and begin to live that thing out. And God is telling us in Ephesians 4, throw off the old persona and put on the new potential. Some of you, that's a word of the Lord for you this morning because how you've been living has not been working. It's not been working for your life. It's not been working for your marriage. It's not been working in your business. It's not been working in your, in your, your public life. And it's time to set aside, to take off that which was connected to the way that God saved you out of. Don't let Jesus and the fact that he has saved and redeemed you be the excuse for you remaining the same. Jesus didn't die for you to remain the same. He died to give you brand new life. But for us to enjoy the brand new life, we've got to set aside the old and begin to put on the new. We've got to put on the new. So don't neglect your progress. Don't go backwards. And thirdly, don't stop growing. Don't stop growing. Verse 25 says this. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbors, for we are members of one another. And be angry and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corruption talk Corrupting talk, come out of your mouths, but only such that is good for those to hear. And do not grieve with the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ has forgiven you. Man, we got literally our third list. Man, you list makers are loving Paul today. Don't stop growing. And so what Paul does is Paul doesn't give like a prescription. Paul is actually giving kind of a description of some practical things that this church in Ephesus could simply do to begin to put on and live out this full method life of following Jesus. And let me just list out these things here and, and, and then we're going to wrap here up here. Number one, be a people of truth. Be a people of truth. Why are we to be, and it doesn't just say be truthful everywhere. He said be truthful to one another. We are what the scripture calls a body. We are the body of Christ. He says be truthful with one another. How ridiculous would this be if my brain told my hand to touch fire? I mean, it'd be absolutely ridiculous that my brain would tell my hand to do something different than what was in front, like, go ahead, touch the fire. There's no danger that's there. No, I'd, I'd burn my hand. 
Or how weird would it be that if I were driving down the road and my eyes told the rest of my body, you know what, that road is straight when the road curves. I'd be in a lot of danger. My family would be in a lot of danger. Uh, why is that? Why are we talking about that type of ridiculousness? Because when it comes to the body of Christ, we are called to be people that are truthful, that walk in truth, and speak truth to one another. Now, let me, now let me just give a little heads up here. I love the scripture says that we speak truth and love to one another. And some of us have utilized that scripture to help attack or to beat up somebody because it feels good to tell them what we want them to hear. That's not the spirit of the chapter. That's not the spirit of the verse, and it's not the spirit of Christ. I do believe sometimes we have to have strong talks, but the reality is we have to be people that walk in the truth. What is the truth? The truth is embodied in one word, and the word is Jesus, who said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So in other words, when we talk, we need to talk like Jesus. We can't live out a new creation if we're not speaking truth to the people around us, specifically to the people here and the people out there. we got to be people of the truth. Secondly, I love this, verse 26 through 27. Secondly, put a timeline on your anger. Put a timeline on your anger. The scripture says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Uh, I've, I've heard this taught with marriages for years, is don't go to bed angry. How many of you said, I forgive you to your spouse and you still went to bed angry? Don't raise your hands. It was last night, Pastor Dave. Don't go to bed angry. That's not really what the scripture means. In your scripture journals, I want you to write down this meaning because this is more accurate. It means don't keep long accounts of your anger. Don't let the sun go down. In other words, don't keep long accounts. Don't keep seething on it. Don't give a place for this thing to live longer. Don't, get, don't let this thing have a shelf. Uh, make sure this thing has a shelf life. Timeline it. Make sure that there is an end to it, that there is a place that you are taking this thing to so that you can work through it and walk in the place of forgiveness. That's what Paul's saying to the church. Timeline your anger. You want to go full method? Be a people that won't live in anger the way everybody else lives in anger i.e., don't live in anger the way people do on Facebook. Put a timeline on it. Put a beginning and end to it. Be done with it. If you don't, some translations say that you have an open door that you are giving to the enemy or a foothold to the enemy. Number three, he talks about thievery. But I wrote this down. Number three, our motivation is, to get, is, is not to get, is to give. Or our motivation to get is in order to give. I love Paul's solution for people that are thieves. He's like, hey, you wanna deal with, with, don't steal, get a job. Don't take that's not what's not yours, get a job. But the motivation for getting a job is not to get the bigger house, it's not to get the bigger things, and not to get the more, the more cars, it's not to get earthly things. The primary focus of getting is so that you can bless somebody that has nothing or to be in position so that if, if you come across the need, you can bless the need. I love that. Paul's like, listen, stop stealing from one another. Stop looking to take from one another. Get a job, go to work, and that way when you see somebody that is in need, if you see somebody that is hurting, you see somebody that's without, guess what you can do? You can come in and you can pour into that. Number four, keep your words fresh. I love the practical advice of Paul. Keep your words fresh. Now, now in your ESV translation, you get the word corruption. That word corruption in the Greek language means this. It usually refers to rotten fruit or decaying meat. Paul makes this stance. That you're in your mouth, out of your mouth, should come no rotten or outdated fruit, meat. Something that can actually make somebody sick or destroy them. Why? Because Mark chapter 12, verse 34 says that what comes out of your mouth is a result of what's in your heart. Paul says this, your words, your Facebook posts, your text, what, the words that come out of your life should do this. I love what he says. It should give grace to those you hear. Our words should give grace, not destroy it. Your words ought to give grace, not steal it. Our words ought to sprinkle grace and not remove it. Number five, strive to bless 
and not break the heart of God. That it, honestly, it's, this scripture comes out of the blue. When you're reading this list, it's like Paul gives all these little practical tips and out of the blue he says, but be careful, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you knew this, you could break the heart of God. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? It's when we walk with the head knowledge of God, but we refuse to let it touch the rest of our life. When we talk about God a lot in church, but we refuse to talk about him out in the world. When we profess faith in Jesus, but our lives look no different than anybody else in this world, that breaks the heart of God. And lastly, I love this, stay clean and dressed is what I wrote, verse 31. Paul goes into a mini list. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you along with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God has forgiven you. Take off that which is soiled, stay clean and be dressed in what God has in store for you. And I've had people say, well, Pastor Dave, I don't have the power to, to take off those things. I don't have the power to remove those addictions or to remove those habits. I don't have it, I don't have it, I don't have it. I'm here to say that you do. I don't have it within me to make the changes that my marriage has. Yes, you do. Pastor, I don't have the, I don't have the, the, the wherewithal in me to change my giving or to change my mentality. Yes, you do. You hear it all the time from me, all the time from me, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave lives in you. And you are God's child. You are chosen. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. And the life of Christ is in you. You are a new person. The old is dead. You have been given power of life to live the life of the new person Jesus has called you to be. You can go full method with this Jesus thing. Not because of what you possess, but because of the spirit of God that is in you. I wrote it this way. There's nothing that God calls you to do that you do not possess the power through the Holy Spirit to accomplish. Whatever God has called you to be, a good husband or a good wife, a good worker, a good witness, a role in a community, a community leader, a politician, a business owner, entrepreneur, or whatever in the world that God has called you to be, Whatever God calls, God equips. And through the Spirit of God, He wants to equip you to be that which He wants you to be. So it's time for us to throw off the old persona and to begin to put on the new potential. Bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're here. And Lord, I'm believing you're ready to take us into a place of progress. And Lord, what I do is I pray over those that are in attendance here with me now and for those that are maybe watching online, maybe they're watching later. And Lord, what I want to speak right now is I want to speak just Holy Ghost encouragement into individuals today. Lord, for every single person that maybe has been down on themselves, Lord, maybe the, maybe the devil has been attacking them and discouraging them because all they can see in the mirror is what they haven't become. Spirit of God, I ask that you would open up their eyes and see the progress that they have made. Lord, even if the only bit of progress is they have put their faith in you, God, I pray that they would stop saying, well, that's the only progress, God. That is the foundation of all progress. That is the salvation that we can't do on our own. And I pray that you would just let, Lord, I just pray that a spirit of encouragement would flood homes and moments and this room here that we would begin to see, Lord, that we are not yet what we should be, but thank God we are not who we used to be. I pray for just a great encouraging spirit in people's hearts today. And yet a tenacity that says, I can't go back to what I was. That Lord, we would have a place, a church that's not only a place of progress, but a place that has a determination that says, I will not, I cannot, I will not go back to who I was before. We can't do what Paul says, be imitators of those that don't know Christ because Lord, we have tasted of your glory and we can't go back. And yet Lord, you gave us very simple, practical things to dive into. And so Lord, I pray just a spirit of repentance in this place where every single one of us would just examine our lives and just say, God, God, give us one thing this week that we can attack. One thing this week that we can set off, that we can put off, 
and one that we could put on that we'd go full method of inhabiting the role of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord. We need you. And Lord, this thing of being a follower of you, God, is something that you don't abandon us to do on our, on our own. You've given us your spirit. So Spirit of God, help us, lead us, guide us, that our lives would be a full method follower of Jesus Christ. I pray all of this in your name we pray. And everyone said, can we give God a huge hand clap of glory today?